Have you ever been in a small boat on a big lake in the middle of the night when a storm came up? The Sea of Galilee is only about seven miles long and, or seven miles wide and 13 miles long, and uh, it's nothing compared to Lake Michigan. But if you're in a small boat in the middle of the night and a storm came up, that little bit of chop that may not bother you other times begins to play on you. I was lucky enough to take a group of students to Jerusalem about 10 years ago, and we were lucky enough to take a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee. It was a big boat with a motor, and a little chop came up. And this story popped into my mind. What must it have been like to be one of those disciples rowing away? That meant the sail was down in a little tiny wooden boat in the middle of the night, rowing three or four miles at that point against the wind. I think we can say they must have been experiencing some trepidation and some fear. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm not sure if any of you recognize my face. It's a little thicker and my hair is a little grayer. But I had the honor to be with you about nine years ago and spoke down at the river before we marched up to the cathedral for a beautiful mass much like this one. It's been my honor and privilege to know Bishop Janke since I was a college freshman. And I have the honor of being the first priest that he ordained. I hope that it wasn't a warm-up act. <laughs> I think we've done okay. But 19 years ago, Bishop Janke laid hands on my head and anointed my hands, and I've had the privilege and the honor to serve God as a Holy Cross priest and to preach his word and to care for the needs of his people, mostly in college ministry, mostly living in residence halls with young men and women, and helping them, hopefully, to grow up in faith and to learn the ways of a life based on the gospel, building on what their parents did, but helping them transition into adulthood, where they themselves will be making good choices and hard choices about what it means to be a businessman with principles, a lawyer who sticks to honesty and truth at the core of their being, teachers who see it as their fundamental responsibility not just to teach the subject but to teach how to live. It is a good life and it's a wonderful life. But like you, like all people, I've known moments on a small boat in the middle of a lake, a big lake, when a storm came up at night. For we've all learned our faith to varying degrees. Hopefully we know what the church believes and teaches and we try to hold it dear in our lives and proclaim it to our children and teach it to our co-workers, not simply with our words, but how we live our life. But each and every one of us, in darker moments, find ourselves like those apostles sitting in the boat in the middle of the lake. And Jesus was not yet with them, the Gospel said today. And we feel sometimes that Jesus is not yet with us. And these apostles, they're pretty new at their craft. They're pretty new to this whole ministry thing. It's interesting, at this time, we're only at the end of the second week of Easter, and already we've run out of things to say about Jesus and what happened to the apostles after the resurrection in the Gospels. We're, we're now back to early in the story. And here in the Gospel of John, all we've had so far is the apostles being called 
Come follow me, we hear. And then, young men, fishermen, tradesmen, laborers, leaving what they know, leaving what they feel comfortable with, to follow a young rabbi. If we know that Jesus was about 20, about 30, his early disciples could have been in their young 20s or maybe even their late teens. They didn't know anything. But they know that this one who had spoken to them and who had called them to say, come follow me, was different. And so Andrew was able to go to his brother Peter and say, come with us. We found the Messiah. We found the anointed one. We found the one that everyone is anticipating. And Peter came too. But after that moment, we have the wedding feast at Cana. Jesus goes down to Jerusalem, then comes back. He cures the royal official's son. And just before today's, tonight's incident, he's fed 5,000 on a hillside. They have witnessed the very power of God coursing through Jesus, not just in his words, but in his ability to heal. They've watched him take five barley loaves and two fish and feed a crowd of 5,000 men, which is probably closer to 10,000, including women and children. And they also had to work that day. They had to pick up all the scraps, which filled 12 baskets. They are walking in the footsteps of someone they've never, the likes of which they've never seen before, who has the very power of God within him. And yet, they don't get it. They can't get it. Doesn't make sense. And though they follow him, at the end of a long day, they get in this boat and they're crossing the lake and the wind is whipping up and Jesus isn't with them and they have that moment that we all hit in our lives where we begin to wonder, is Jesus with us? We begin to perhaps question the very tenets of our faith. We wonder as children get sick and sometimes die, as marriages hit rocky patches, as jobs disappear, and life becomes incredibly difficult. We begin to wonder and are tempted to indulge that question, does, is God with me? Is Jesus walking beside me. And in a life of faith, it's okay. Because it is faith. And faith implies an edge of doubt. But faith means that if we do trust in this Lord that we've walked with since our baptism, that we are also going to bring that very doubt, those moments of weakness, those moments of hurt and anger and despair, we're going to bring those two to our prayer and to our God and, and say, heal me. And just when they were in a moment of despair, there is Jesus walking on the water. Jesus walking on the crest of the waves of the sea, just as described in the prophet Job. And they... They, found, they find joy again. And my favorite is, they want to invite him into the boat, but they were suddenly already there. After hours of pulling against the waves, hours of doubt and worry and fear, they realized Jesus was with them. And the place they were going, they arrive at. That is also part of the Christian journey. For each and every one of us to recognize that though we might have moments of worry, doubt, and fear, that Jesus does walk with us. Jesus is our companion. And Jesus will support us and guide us when we admit 
our human weakness. We ask for the grace to pull through. And we cooperate with that grace in such a way that our lives become stronger and fuller and more complete. And that's what you as men in the Catholic Church, you as fathers of families and grandfathers, you as uncles, that's what your role is, is to help young people and co-workers and friends to recognize that we walk with Christ and he walks with us and that he will pull us through because if we allow that grace to fill us we can arrive at true moment of humility humility which calls us to recognize that the entire entirety of our being rests in the love of God and that we can do nothing and be no one without him but if we accept that we take on the strength of God and true humility, Christian humility is not necessarily weak or meek, it is strong. A truly humble person stands up for what is right because it's right and he can do no other than to defend the truth. A truly humble person is able to admit weakness and when they're wrong. And this may be at work, or this may be in your family with your wives. In a remarkably wonderful phrase to say, and learn to say, and say without hesitation is, my bad. I made a mistake. Because when we admit our weakness, when we admit our mistakes, we can then move on. When we say to our wives, I'm sorry for whatever little thing you just did, probably something you've done a lot. But when, we, when you say, I'm sorry for what I said, the tone I used, the disparaging look or remark, when you say, I am truly sorry because you and I are walking our journey of faith together, that is a profound moment of transformation in your marriage, allowing you to rebuild and to move forward. And when your children see you giving each other forgiveness and seeking it, they understand another important aspect of walking with Jesus, which is to say that we must always be men and women but we must always be men of forgiveness. People will do horrible things in society and in our, in our lives. People will hurt you. People will say and do things to further their careers which will hurt yours. Family members will say the very thing they know that will cut you to the core because they know you so well. And as Christians, we offer forgiveness. Not because what they said or did was okay, but because when we can accept the suffering, challenge the behavior as necessary, but offer true and lasting and meaningful forgiveness to someone who has hurt us or hurt society, we begin to live the joy and the peace which is Christ. We begin to live the fullness of what God calls each and every one of us and all of us together as the body of Christ to be. We become the living presence of Christ in our world. We allow Christ to live in us and through us. And when Catholic men of faith with true humility and a true commitment to truth and honesty also live out the true and living virtue of forgiveness. Our world, our community, our city, and our, especially our families and our churches become different places. They become the living home of the body of Christ, not just in the tabernacle, but fed from the food from the table and that body of Christ goes forth streaming love and justice and peace through our streets and into our world. 
Catherine of Siena, who we also celebrate today, was a pain in the butt. She challenged everyone with the truth she knew from Jesus about reconciliation in a church that was divided and about living faithfully to the fullness of what Christ calls us. From that place 14, in the 14th century in Siena, Italy, to around Europe and into France, she spread the truth as she understood it, but she endlessly called the church to reconciliation and forgiveness so that it could move forward as the body of Christ. The call that Catherine of Siena put out was the word of Christ. It's the same word that we hear and that we live and is preached to us day in and day out, and it's a word that we must feel in our hearts so that when we are in that boat, in the big lake of our lives, when we have moments of worry, doubt, fear, we can turn over our shoulder and see Christ standing there and allow ourselves to be fed with his love and his mercy. And we can go forward in our world being love and mercy and forgiveness, being the body of Christ.